please welcome Professor Robert Wistra. Today's lecture is entitled Antisemitism and Holocaust Denial in the Contemporary World. Uh, Professor Wistra is the director of the Vidal Sassoon Center for the Study of Antisemitism at Hebrew University. And as many of you know, there's four, I guess, centers that are focused on issues of antisemitism around the world. There's the Hebrew University, uh, there's the Stephen Roth at Tel Aviv University, and there's the Institute at the Technical University of Berlin, and now YISO, which is the, I guess, the youngest and newest of the four. And just as a, an aside, I think when we started trying to create the center here, obviously the Vidal Sassoon Institute was really the model that we were trying to emulate and continue to try to emulate. This was the preeminent uh, place where people are carrying out uh, high caliber research. So it's really an honor that you're here with us. Uh, Professor Wistra is um, holds the Neuberger Chair for Modern European and Jewish History at the Hebrew University. And he's been the director of the Vidal Sassoon Institute since 2002. He's also the editor of the journal Antisemitism International, which comes out of the Vidal Sassoon Center. In 1985, his book on socialism and the Jews received the joint award of the American Jewish Committee and the Sassoon Center in Jerusalem. In 1991, Professor Wistrup was awarded the Austrian State Prize for his much acclaimed study of the Jews of Vienna in the age of Franz Joseph. A year later, he received the H.H. H. Wingate Nonfiction Literary Award in the UK for his publication, which is well known to everybody here, Anti-Semitism, The Longest Hatred, which also became a major PBS documentary that was shown internationally. Um, he has, and, and which Professor Wistrup uh, scripted and edited the, the, the film. He acted as the historical advisor and scriptwriter for, edit, for the, an editor of several BBC documentaries, including Good Morning, Mr. Hitler, Blaming the Jews, and, and the acclaimed and popular film Obsession, which came out in 2006. Between 1999 and 2001, he was one of six historians that were invited by the Vatican um, to look into and study the, the documents relating to Pope Pius XII and the Second World War. In 2007, he published, the, he published Laboratory for World Destruction, Germans and Jews in Central Europe, which came out with uh, the University of Nebraska. His forthcoming book, which is approximately 1,300 pages, is entitled A Lethal Obsession, Antisemitism from Antiquity to Global Jihad, which will be coming out by Random House in, 2000, in October 2009. So it's really an honor that you're here. We thank you for coming. And just as a, a note, um, for Yale faculty and uh, students, there's going to be another small session, a sort of a private Yale session, at 11 o'clock tomorrow here at, at YISA. So if anybody here would like to come, please speak to me or, or Lauren and Professor Wistra um, graciously accepted to do a special session for, for the scholars here. So without further ado, thank you and welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Charles, for that uh, warm introduction. And let me say, much though it surprises me, that this is the first time I've had the privilege to be here on this wonderful campus of Yale University. Um, I guess it's just one of those things. It was painted to be now, and I'm particularly glad that it is now, because perhaps the topic which I um, will be addressing is uh, indeed more timely than it has ever been. Let me uh, begin with a few uh, more personal words before I uh, address the core of uh, the subject this evening. I was thinking over in my mind as I was jet lagged last, last night, when did I first ever begin to think about this subject? At what point in my life? And it occurred to me, if I could put my finger on a time and a place, that it was in Poland on my first visit as a teenager, in fact at the end of my teens, I was 19 years old, um, and it was, uh, it was 1966, it was a visit for one month to Poland, then communist Poland, which was designed for people living in Britain 
where I was living at the time, who were of Polish extraction. And I agreed and thought this was a good opportunity to see a country which I had not been in since I was three years old and I had only the vaguest of memories of. And this visit to Auschwitz with a Polish woman guide who of course was espousing the official communist <coughs> line regarding uh, what we now call the Holocaust, but that was not a term that was widely used, if at all, at the time, presented something that even to someone like myself, who had only limited historical knowledge at that point, was so self-evidently false that I couldn't help it but burst out in anger because um, after reeling off a long list of victims uh, who had met their deaths at this uh, camp, the last in a long list of nationalities that was mentioned, perhaps 20 different nationalities, almost as an afterthought, a postscriptum, was Jews of different nationalities in Europe. And that was all that I heard about the specific concrete fate of the Jews in the death camp of Auschwitz. Now, of course, since my child, since my parents were born in Poland, and since all their friends and acquaintances were from a similar, I would say, Polish, Jewish, middle-class background before the war. Quite a number of them were in fact survivors who had been through that inferno. And therefore, from an early age, I was aware of their experiences, even if I did not and could not fully take the measure of what that meant. I particularly remember from the 1960s because there had been a court case in Britain involving one of the most frequent guests at my parents' home. Her name was Dr. Alina Brevka, and she had worked in the medical section of Auschwitz. She had a tattoo number, and she had worked with a Polish doctor called Dr. Derek. And this was the subject of a well-known court case which prompted a novel by the American Jewish writer, best-selling author, Leon Uris, called QE2, which later became a documentary drama. And I knew all about Dr. Bradford's experiences. So of course, um, there was a great gap between what I was aware of at that level, experiential level, of people who had gone through it. Another um, close friend of my parents who came regularly on Friday night to our home was subsequently a historian called Dr. Joseph Marcus, who wrote an important book on the social and political history of the Jews of Poland between the wars. He was an Auschwitz survivor. So when I heard this version, this official communist version of the fate of the Jews, not only in Auschwitz, but more generally, I was uh, sensitized, but nobody at that time whom I knew about, and no one in the academic world discussed an issue such as Holocaust denial. It existed. It had existed since 1945. And by and large, it had been on the margins, certainly on the margins of the scholarly world. It didn't have any particular respectability anywhere, but it was a presence in some countries more than others. My second experience, and all these things I will go into in more detail later from a, from a more scholarly perspective. My second experience was participating on the barricades in Paris in 1968. In a brief period that I had, I stress brief as a wandering revolutionary. And I remember, um, to this day, the, the extraordinary moment when the French students 
began to uh, chant the slogan, Nous sommes tous des Juifs Allemands, des Juifs Allemands. We are all German Jews. This, in protest, at the expulsion of one of the leaders of the student revolt, Daniel Cohn-Bendit, who was indeed a German Jew, whom the French authorities chose not to readmit to France, and in fact, that ban was upheld for a long time. So this was an act of solidarity of students, but it also had a historic dimension. A year later, I should say, that in the same milieu, I was aware of somewhat different slogans that began to appear as graffiti on some university campuses, such as Palestine Blanca, Palestine will triumph. And that was significant to me precisely because I considered myself in some vague way as a leftist in 1968, 69, because I think looking back today with a perspective of 40 years, we can see that that was the beginning, a seed plot of a development that I will speak about a bit later, of the transformation of the attitude of a large section of the left to Jews, to Israel in particular, and also to the Holocaust. And since, in that same year, 1969, briefly, I even had a German girlfriend who came from Berlin and who was involved with a Maoist circle in Berlin that used to run around the streets protesting about every imaginable oppressive regime, and of course the United States in the forefront. Oppressor number one. I once accompanied her to Berlin, my first visit, West Berlin at the time, and heard a slogan which even to this day I can never forget it. A slogan, we have a number of people from Germany in this room, so they'll correct, correct me if I remember it wrong. Schlagt die Zionisten tot, macht die Namen Osten rot. Beat the Zionists to death and make the Middle East red. This was certainly ultra left politics and it made its first appearance, I believe, around that time. And uh, certainly, uh, Berlin was one of the centres of this agitation. Next phase, if I'm just drawing a few landmarks for myself, um, was 1974. I began work at an institution that was a prominent research institution in London called the Wiener Library and the Institute of Contemporary History. And I was the research director between 1974 and 1980. I had just finished my doctorate, I was still in my late twenties, but already aware that something was changing and that it had to do with perceptions of the Holocaust, which by then was a term that was in use. And I could not but become more aware of it because the institution which I began to work at in 1974 was perhaps the preeminent institution in Great Britain and one of the three or four most important such institutions in the whole of Europe for the study and research into the Third Reich. The Wiener Library, created by a German Jewish refugee from Potsdam, Alfred Wiener, who had escaped to Great Britain in 1939. 
The librarian of this institution, with whom I became friendly, had a tattoo on her arm. And she had been in another camp. And she was extremely perturbed. And that's probably an understatement. By the first beginnings in the UK of a more visible form of Holocaust denial. And she was the one who brought it to my attention. I remember how distraught she was when she came with an article that appeared in a journal, a respected British journal, which reviews books, called Books and Bookman. It no longer exists. And there was an article by a best-selling English author, A. a. N. Wilson. <coughs> Astonishingly, he chose to write a lengthy review of a pamphlet, not a book, a pamphlet which was written by somebody who called himself Richard Harwood, which was a pseudonym, an alias, for the man whose real name was Richard Verrill, who was the editor of the main journal of the National Front in Britain, which was rising in the 1970s a far-right organization, and its journal was called Spearhead. And under a pseudonym, he wrote uh, this pamphlet in which he echoed a number of theses which were not then widely known, at least in Britain, because Holocaust denial and this is what I'll come to in a moment. Holocaust denial had, after 1945, found its main um, sources in the United States, in France, and in Germany. West Germany. But what I remember above all about Mrs. Johnson was the paleness of her face when she showed me this article which praised Harwood's pamphlet, which was a Holocaust denial pamphlet, pure and simple. And the feeling of despair, which I think brought home to me for the first time, that if you had actually been through the Holocaust, this was like being threatened and symbolically put to death a second time. An attempt to destroy the memory of what happened was seen, I think rightly, as an attempt to complete the work that had not been fully completed of annihilating the Jewish people. Subsequently, and in the nature of things, my own work became more involved in this area. First, establishing the facts and interpretations of the Holocaust as an event, writing a kind of encyclopedia, Who's Who in Nazi Germany, which was published in 1982. It's gone through, I don't know how many editions, been translated into many languages that has been particularly successful of all places, and I shudder to think why, in Japan. But, having studied the biographies of many of the people involved, at first sight, when one comes to the Holocaust denial publications, one is tempted simply to throw them all in the waste paper basket, shrug one's shoulders and at best ask oneself whether there are any limits to human folly and indeed wickedness. But of course this would be a completely inappropriate reaction. 
And difficult though it is, one has to recognize the fact that this movement, which should by rights be completely relegated to the margin and barely worth a discussion such as this, it's no longer the case. We don't have that luxury. Because Holocaust denial, for many reasons, does have a future. One obvious reason is that we are more than 60 years since the end of the Second World War. And the number of those who were actually eyewitnesses, who lived through it, is thinning by the year. And soon we will reach a point where there are no more witnesses. And having experienced what it is like to try and communicate the lessons of the Holocaust and what actually happened at a more basic level to the younger generation and seeing the changes in the last few years there's every reason for concern. 1997 I made a film called Understanding the Holocaust for British schools. It was commissioned by the Holocaust Education Trust in the UK. And it's widely, widely used in British schools. And I would say until the year 2001, things were going well. Teachers seemed to be pleased. It was a compulsory topic in the educational curriculum in the UK. It was even being used as a model in a number of other countries. And then occurred a very striking change and I saw it a few times myself when confronted with 16-year-olds and 17-year-olds <coughs> who met with the teachers, with myself, and with my co-producer uh, for this film. And we saw that the kind of questions which are now commonplace and discussed even in mainstream discourse regarding, in particular, Israel and the Holocaust, that they were coming up spontaneously. Sometimes they were brought up by Muslim uh, pupils, sometimes by others. Sometimes they were white pupils who had simply been uh, introduced at some level to Holocaust denial literature and clearly were more than skeptical that anything like this had happened. And so we are, in some ways, back to square one. Despite the massive effort that has under, been undertaken over the last two, three decades, particularly here in the United States, but also in Europe, of commemoration, of education, intense effort in the media, in literature, in film, theatre. The Holocaust, as we all know, permeates the culture of the West. And yet, it seems to me that in terms of education for tolerance, against racism and specifically against anti-Semitism, there is a question mark, a serious question mark. Now I've just come from London. Charles was there as well, and he can no doubt comment if he wishes to about what took place there. In many ways an important conference in which parliamentarians, particularly from Europe but from other parts of the world, were trying to devise ways and strategies to combat the alarming growth of anti-Semitism on a global scale. And one of the things which I found naive but predictable was that many politicians repeated as a kind of mantra something which is indeed widely held that 
Holocaust commemoration and the study of the Holocaust and the obligatory educational promotion of it is a therapy, is a effective counterweight to the rise in anti-Semitism. And I'm convinced that this is not the case. In some cases it may be true, and it is not an argument to abandon these efforts. We don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Nevertheless, it is a very simplistic notion. And I think some of the remarks that I will make now will perhaps demonstrate why. First of all, very, very briefly, it is a sickening topic, and I don't want to belabor the point because I'm sure that everyone in this room knows it very well. One of the broad claims of Holocaust deniers of the hardcore type, they of course say that there was no such thing as a mass murder of European Jewry during the Second World War. If they concede that there were indeed Jewish victims, these range from approximately 300,000 to a, perhaps a high watermark of a million at best. And they were not victims of a planned, premeditated execution, and certainly not of gassing. No gassing is one of the major uh, slogans of all Holocaust deniers, whatever their colour or their politics. They were victims of disease, epidemics, of uh, natural causes. The disorganization towards the end of the war and other factors. Holocaust deniers across the board of this type will argue that all the eyewitness testimonies are worthless. That the Nuremberg trials are so value because that was victor's justice that the confessions of Nazi war criminals were forced. They invariably say that the photographs that we have were faked. And, in general, they argue, although there are some variations, on who was behind the quote unquote invention of the Holocaust, but they argue that this was either the Allies, the Western Allies, sometimes because they wished to keep Germany down after the war and therefore it was essential to offload this massive guilt for a stupendous crime onto the Germans, or it was the Communists, because the Communists needed a cover for their own Stalinist crimes, and what better than to present Nazi Germany as the culmination of the absolute evil, or and above all, it was the Jews, and especially over the years it became the Zionists. The Zionists who invented this hope, sometimes together with the communists, and then later that became unfashionable, so it was together with the Western Allies, and eventually even the Western Allies it faded from the picture, and it became the great Zionist hoax. Which obviously in the contemporary climate is more and more fashionable. If we look at the kind of people who, in the early years, the 1940s, 1950s, advocated such ideas. A number of the pioneers were American. One at least, Harry Elmer Barnes, a historian, as far as I'm aware, was not motivated by anti-Semitism. He came from the isolationist school and he was uh, convinced that the crimes of the Allies themselves in the bombing of German cities, for instance, were infinitely worse than those attributed, which in any case he didn't. Uh, believes uh, the German crimes were the result, at best, of a breakdown in the food supply and uh, 
and such uh, factors. Another American pioneer of German-American background, and this is a fact not to be overlooked, although it is sometimes, that people of German extraction have at times um, been prominent among the uh, hardcore Holocaust deniers. One good example today is the Australian, Frederick Tobin, who is uh, the German, of German descent. An American who was prominent in this area was actually formerly a professor of English at La Salle College in Philadelphia. Um, his name was App, and he wrote a book called The Six Million Swindle, blackmailing the German people for hard marks with fabricated corpses. Another American who briefly had his moment of undeserved fame was an unlicensed engineer called Fred Leuchter, who in the late 1980s had been sent to Auschwitz in order to take forensic samples. He went to Auschwitz and Majdanek, and he, he claimed he could find no significant traces of the toxic in Cyclone B. This prompted the English historian, one of the most highly publicized of all Holocaust deniers, David Irving, certainly the most notorious by far, to claim in 1988 that this man, Fred Leuchter, had convinced him, after serious thought, Fred Leuchter had convinced David Irving that indeed the Holocaust was nothing but a hoax. He said in an interview in 1989 for a well-known British newspaper, this is the end of the line for the Auschwitz myth. I wouldn't like to dwell, though I'll say a few words about <coughs> Irving, I wouldn't like to dwell too much on a man whom I think the British media in particular, but also media around the world, <coughs> are guilty of having inflated to unbelievably undeserved proportions. Uh, there was a time where Irving might perhaps have been considered a historian who dug up some new facts because of his excellent connections with former Nazis, who trusted him, which says we get a great deal. He wrote a best-selling work in 1977 when I was still working at the Wiener Library called Hitler's War. And I met David Irving at least four or five times in the course of my work there because he used to come to the Wiener Library for his research. And I didn't know that much about him at the time. But he was really a frightening person to be sitting opposite. Um, and that was before you know, I knew anything about his reputation. And Mr. Johnson always warned me about it. Said, There's nothing we can do. We can't close the library to him. But she didn't know how right she was. Irving was more known at that time for saying that Churchill was a greater war criminal than Hitler and that the Allied bombing of Dresden was a war crime far greater than anything that had been committed uh, by the Nazis. But he didn't seem that interested in Jews, or so it seemed. This only fully emerged in the 1980s. And even today, after a high court judgment that convicted him, as a racist, an anti-Semite, a liar, a distorter, a falsifier of history. Even today he has his following, although he was dealt a blow by the court case of 2000 involving his attempt to uh, receive damages from uh, a few lines that Deborah Lipstadt had written about him in her book on Holocaust Denial in 1993. The Austrians, of all people, put David Irving in prison for three years because they have tough laws about Holocaust denial, as does Germany, which doesn't mean that it, it isn't flourishing in its own way in both of these two countries. 
which suggests that legislation in this area is not necessarily always effective. Although that remains an ongoing debate as to whether Holocaust deniers should be censored, whether they should be uh, put in prison, as is the case in a number of European countries, including France, which has a particularly tough law. But as we'll see, that is not surprising, given the scale of the problem there. So America has played a, a significant role. And here I must mention in passing a veteran of American racism and a hardcore anti-Semite racist and white supremacist, Willis Carter, who I believe is still alive, and a very wealthy man, who among other things financed, would created the Institute of Historical Review and its annual, the Journal of Historic Review in Torrance, California, which became uh, a magnet for many Holocaust deniers from around the world. Carto in the 60s was very much a, a prominent member of a group that some of you uh, may remember, the Liberty Lobby, <coughs> which he headed which was, at that time, the best organized anti-Semitic organization in the United States. And he uh, financed and sponsored a number of Holocaust denial works at that time. But when the Institute of Historical Review was founded, this indicated a shift that took place through the 1970s and 80s of pseudo-scientific academization, would-be academization of the whole subject. This is when you begin to get work such as Arthur Butts, another American, and a professor of electrical engineering at uh, Evanston, who uh, wrote a book called The Hoax of the 20th Century, in which he claimed that Auschwitz was nothing but an industrial plant, a highly productive work camp. Indeed, it was highly productive of corpses. But um, Butts, um, among other things, claimed that cyclone B was nothing but insecticide, that the gas chambers were in fact baths, saunas, and mortuaries, and so on and so on. I'll spare you the details. But that had a superficial plausibility for someone who knew nothing about the subject. And in particular, he claimed that he was initiating a scientific approach to a subject which had become a religion. He spoke about the Holocaust religion. And this became a theme that was picked up in the 1980s by those who now claim to be in the forefront of critical method as opposed to those who had accepted a mythical version of history, one which was prompted by Zionist machinations. This brings me to France. I mentioned that France has a strong uh, Holocaust denial legislation to prohibit Holocaust denial. Actually introduced by communist deputy in 1990. France was indeed, at the more intellectual level, the country which pioneered new approaches to this rather perverse worldview. The pioneer, the first one, was an out and out fascist. Maurice Valdesch, who published a book in 1948 called Nuremberg, about the uh, Nuremberg trials. Nuremberg ou la terre promise, and, or the promised land. In which he claimed that the Allies had instigated World War II, 
the Allies on World Jewry, um, accused them of inventing the fiction of the gas chambers, and he pursued this line in the journal, which was well known in far right circles in the 1950s and 60s, uh, of the defense of the West. The more interesting case, the one who's considered like <coughs> the godfather of all Holocaust deniers, was another Frenchman, Paul Racinier, a one time communist then socialist deputy, who had been a prisoner of Buchenwald. And on the basis of his very limited experiences of Buchenwald, which was not, of course, a death camp, he made all kinds of uh, entirely false extrapolations. And by 1950, he was claiming that Jewish historians in particular and scholars had falsified uh, the story of the camps and that Israel and world Jewry had deliberately uh, magnified the death toll in order to increase their ill-gotten gain. A subsequent series of works, Le Mensonge du Lys, The Lie of Ulysses, which was prefaced by um, a neo-fascist friend of Céline, the French writer and anti-Semite from the 1930s, Racinier um, expanded on his theories about what had happened to European Jewry. By the 1960s, this man who was, had been a socialist was now clearly in the far right camp. But by the end of the 1960s, this type of Holocaust denial seemed to be on the retreat. At least in France. The banner was picked up by Robert Foisson, who was a professor of French literature at the University of Lyon before he was removed from that. Although Lyon remained one of the centers of revisionism, quote unquote, or negationisme, as the French prefer to call it, negationism. Um, and there was a small academic nucleus of academic professors in different fields who encouraged this or that version of historical revisionism about the Holocaust. The climate in France by the end of the 1970s was favorable to this. Um, there was a notorious front page of the magazine L'Express with an interview with Dapier de Pelpois, who had been the Commissioner of Jewish Affairs in Vichy, France, in which he was quoted as saying, only lice were gassed in Auschwitz. On French radio a year later, Corisson declared, and I think this might stand for the the sort of founding proclamation of contemporary Holocaust denial, he said the following. The claim of the existence of gas chambers and the genocide of Jews by Hitler constitute one and the same historical lie, which opened the way to a gigantic political and financial fraud of which the principal beneficiaries are the State of Israel and international Zionism and the principal victims are the Germans and the entire Palestinian people. And interestingly, in the early 1980s, even highly respectable newspapers like Le Monde gave a platform to people like Faurisson, and he had a small following outside of the normal uh, kind of constituency for Holocaust deniers, among libertarians, among people who claimed that freedom of speech was dear to their hearts, and the preface to his work was written by none other than Noam Chomsky, the great libertarian himself, and uh, of course well known for his critique of American imperialism and Israeli imperialism and many other uh, 
evils of that nature. But not for his discernment when it comes to matters like this. And in the name of free speech, he said the most ridiculous things in his introduction to Forisson's work, among which was the claim that he could see nothing anti-Semitic <coughs> in Holocaust denial per se, and even calling Forisson a liberal, which uh, of course was very far from being the truth. <coughs> Forisson remains the veteran, uh, not only in France, of Holocaust denial, and he was uh, he was taken quite seriously by some intellectuals and academics in France until the work, the deconstructionist work of the historian Pierre Vidal, okay, who's no longer alive but did a remarkable job, I think, in deconstructing um, the reasoning or the, the uh, lack of logic of um, people like Faurisson. It's also this time that we see the rise of a Holocaust revisionism among a section, a small section of Italy, of the far left in France. And they have a publishing house, La Vieto, the Old Mole, which, um, which published not only uh, works such as those of uh, Lassigny's disciples and Faurisson, but the works of the two leading lights in the circle, Pierre Guillon, uh, a left-wing uh, anarchist, and Serge Tillon. And their reasoning, if we can call it that, is really bizarre. In the first place, they did not come to this Holocaust denial from the left on the basis of anti-Semitism or any sympathy with Nazism or any desire to rehabilitate fascism which more generally were the motivations of those who came from the right. Their logic was that the uniqueness attributed to Nazi crimes was a severe an unacceptable obstacle to the cause of revolution. That it had created the misconception about who the real enemy was. They were opposed to the anti-fascist consensus that had developed around the idea in post-war Europe that Nazism was the ultimate expression of evil. Because for them, the enemy remained capitalism. <coughs> And indeed, they were also highly critical of Stalin's uh, uh, socialism. And in one variation of this left-wing Holocaust denial, that adopted by the brother of Daniel Cohn Bendit, uh, Gabriel Cohn Bendit, uh, we even reach the bizarre conclusion that it was Soviet propaganda that had invented the legend of the gas chamber in order to cover up the crimes of the Gulag. So, these are some of the bizarre uh, side uh, effects of this kind of reasoning. I would like to jump now, make a considerable leap, over some of the points which I addressed in my paper, particularly about Eastern Europe. Um, not because it's unimportant, I'll be happy to answer any question relating to the uh, Soviet Union, to uh, Germany itself, to Austria, to Romania, uh, Poland, um, Slovakia, and Croatia. All of these stories have their own specific nuances and uh, causes, and they're all important. <coughs> but because of the pressure of time, and also in order to be able to explicate a little more closely 
what I see as the um, particularly disturbing today, at least, uh, question of left-wing Holocaust revisionism, which I would prefer to call Holocaust inversion rather than Holocaust denial, although sometimes the boundaries between these two things become blurred, I would like, first of all, to give an example from a book which I brought here with me, which is not for academicians, it's called The Holocaust for Beginners. Some of you may know this series, which is extremely popular and successful. It can be easily obtained in bookshops, um, I assume in, in the United States as well. The three authors of this particular uh, work, which was first published in 1994, but is still widely available, there were three authors. Two of them were British, illustrators and designers, filmmakers. One of them, Stuart Hood, was actually a very high-ranking person in the BBC and had been a professor, ex-professor, at the Royal College of Art in London. But the most interesting of the third author, Chaim Breshit, if I pronounce his name rightly, I should pronounce it rightly because he's an Israeli, living in exile in London, and it says here a socialist, more accurately I would say a Trotskyist. And he's been extremely active in the anti-Israel, militant anti-Israel cause in Britain ever since he arrived there. To this day, he's one of the architects of what's called Israel Apartheid Week, which will begin very shortly, you know, worldwide um, celebrations of Israel Apartheid Week will begin in the first week of March. And he has been extremely militant in this regard. At the end of this, uh, otherwise unexceptionable, unexceptionable work, there's a section on the aftermath, which my guess is was written by Chaim. And it sums up many of the themes that characterize left-wing Holocaust inversion. He goes back to the Eichmann trial. The Eichmann trial is a show trial. That's why he thinks that Hannah Arendt said the most profound things that have ever been said on the subject. And he compares the show trial of 1960, where Adolf Eichmann was eventually sentenced to death, the only death sentence um, officially that Israel ever carried out um, by judicial process, um, he compares it with the Soviet Stalinist show trials, with Nazi Germany's show trials, and he says that this was a falsification, typical of Israel, a falsification of the Holocaust to serve national and political ends, just as the Demonyuk trial. He says the same thing, which happened in the 1980s concerning the Ukrainian guard in one of the uh, death camps. His point is, regarding the aftermath, that Israel and Zionism have always used the Holocaust, exploited it, in order to blunt or prevent any criticism of the state of Israel. That's one major point. Secondly, he claims that Yad Vashem, because of the monopoly that it had, uh, certainly at one time, I would say, not today, um, on uh, interpretation of the Holocaust, whether in Israel and to some extent uh, abroad, that it deliberately favoured an intentionalist approach which assumed that anti-Semitism was a driving force of the Holocaust when it clearly, if you read this work, it was not. In fact, it was altogether 
set degree. Now that is a school of thought. Um, nothing, obviously nothing anti-symmetric about saying that. What is interesting, and of course completely misleading, is the assumption that there is any kind of hand of the state, either in Israeli academic life or that I can speak from personal experience, which favours, encourages, promotes an intentionalist uh, approach. S simply things don't work that way, quite apart from the fact that it is not in itself true. More significant is uh, the point usually made by Jewish anti-Zionists in this form of Holocaust inversion, which is to say that Israel has illegitimately set itself up since its foundation as the spokesperson for the Jewish dead. More legitimately, the one point I would agree with in this aftermath is the scandal of the fact that by negotiating the claims conference deals which permitted Israel to receive much of the compensation that was given uh, from Germany, uh, this ended up very much being at the expense of those who actually suffered, the actual victims who were given a raw deal in Israel, much more so than there were elsewhere. This has come to light much more in recent years. It is a scandal of the First Order and has been treated as such within Israel itself. This is virtually the only point in the aftermath that I think is accurate. But where this form of Holocaust inversion becomes more blatant is where it is said that the Zionists successfully milked, this is a word that's used, milked the guilt complex of the West, not just of Germany, but of the United States and the West as a whole, the guilt complex of the West, in order to carry out, to implement its own racist policies towards the Palestinians. And creating this connect between two, uh, two very different things. And in particular, the use of this idea of exploitation and milking of a, a guilt complex. And suggesting that the West played along with this because of its own anti-Semitism, it was only too willing, it's a vast generalization, of course, that wouldn't stand up to close analysis, but that the West played along with this because the colonial solution to its own, as it were, crimes vis-a-vis -vis the Jews was the convenient one. I would say this is a mild form as things go, and in comparison with what goes down today, this is still a mild form of what we get uh, by way of left-wing revisionism. I myself was involved in a debate just over 20 years ago that took place, quite an intense debate in London over the staging of a play called Perdition by a working class, Irish working class, left-wing Trotskyist playwright called Jim Allen. He wrote the play called Perdition, centered on the Kastner affair, the story of the Hungarian Zionist Jewish leader in Budapest who um, made a deal whereby a special train was able to take out close to 2,000 people, some of them connected to him, some of them prominent people, wealthier Jews, who survived the Holocaust by going to Switzerland. It wasn't automatic they survived, I won't go into that story. And the price of that was his silence, and he didn't warn Hungarian jury about the imminent mass deportation which led to the mass death of half a million Hungarian Jews in Auschwitz in 1944. 
um, a very heavy accusation that was dealt with long before Jim Allen got his hands on it. And ironically, most of the things he had to say in his play were said in the 1940s already in another play by an American playwright and screenwriter, Ben Heck, who was very well known in Hollywood and who was a right-wing Zionist. He belonged to the, who was a sympathizer with the Ilgun. And Ben Hecht had some fierce criticism of the labor establishment, the Mapai establishment in Israel, and this was a way to strike a blow at them as well. To say that they had betrayed, they had betrayed the Jews in a way, by not fighting for the, uh, um, for the mass of Jews. And the Kasna affair in Israel was prosecuted by a man called Shmuel Tamir, who was very close to this same camp. And he was helped by Uri Avneri, who today is considered a very prominent Israeli Zion, um, left wing uh, uh, critic of Zionism, very pro Palestinian. But Uri Avneri at that time was a prominent figure in the other closer to the other camp, who helped Shul Tamir because he hated the labor establishment in Israel. <coughs> and I saw only a few weeks ago on Israel television, Ori Avneri, saying that yes, he felt he had contributed to Kastner's death because Kastner was assassinated in Israel after a court case in which um, he was not imprisoned, but he had brought libel proceedings. And the judge, a lady, had ruled that he had sold his soul to the devil, which was like giving him a death sentence. Because then a young man went out and shot him. He'd sold his soul to the devil because he had made a deal with, with uh, Eichmann and with the SS. All this is very difficult to establish the full truth. I mean, even to this day, whether Kastner was really what uh, he was made out to be. What is significant here is the use that Jim Allen made of this story. And he claimed that he had struck the most devastating blow against Zionism ever struck because he had tackled the myth, he uses the term, of the Holocaust. But when he uses the myth of the Holocaust, it's not to say, as the hardcore deniers say, it never happened. It's rather to say, yes, it happened, but the Zionists, were co-responsible. They were at least equal in their responsibility to the Nazis. They were complicit from the word go. And a lot of left-wing discourse today, around the world, repeats this. In parrot-like fashion. Nazi-Zionist collaboration, Zionist complicity, and in some extreme cases, the Zionists being worse than the Nazis, and even driving the Nazis and influencing their race doctrines, and so on. And one comes across this more and more, even in some parts of the mainstream left. I want now to make another big leap, because time is running out. I make a short bridge to the Muslim world, and to make it via a former star in the left-wing firmament in France, born a Catholic, an intellectual, I heard the name being whispered already, <laughs> Roger Gavaudy, who was brought to trial in Paris in 1995 after publishing his work, Les Mythes Fondateurs, the founding myths of Zionism. And he was uh, convicted, because of the French laws against Holocaust denial, of in fact engaging in that. He did not begin as a Holocaust denial. It was a long odyssey. He was even at one time a kind of philo -Sima. He was a friend of the founder of the League, of Defense League Against Anti-Semitism in France. He was a dissident communist. He converted to Islam, this dissident communist, in 1980, he married a Palestinian woman. And from then on, 
I mean, as far as our subject is concerned, it's all downhill. It's an escalating story that reaches this point of conviction in a French court in 1995. But in the Arab world, and this will be the, my last section, I'll try and make it brief, because I will elaborate on this tomorrow in, from another angle. In the Arab world, Garoudi went on a tour of Cairo, Beirut, Damascus, Tehran, and he was received like a king, like a culture hero. All the prominent politicians and clerics and journalists feated him. Money was raised for his defense. Um, even people like the late Prime Minister of Lebanon, Rafiq Kariri, the former president of Iran, Rafsan, uh, uh, Rafsan Jani, prominent Palestinian <coughs> intellectuals, they all presented him as a martyr, a martyr of Zionism, of a world Jewish conspiracy. He had dared to say the truth. Raf Sanjani, a prominent figure in Iran, even said that after studying Garadi, he finally understood there were only 200,000 victims. And of course, the Zionists had inflated this beyond all imagination. And the truth is that in the Sunni Arab world, Holocaust denial in the last 15 years has become extremely widespread and popular. You find it in mainstream newspapers, some of them state-sponsored, some of them opposition papers, among intellectuals and journalists. You find it in documentary programs, of course, in sermons, it is so widespread, the Auschwitz lie, this is a clear case of Arab anti-Semitism having imported something from the West. A lot of Arab anti-Semitism and Iranian anti-Semitism is indigenous and arises from Islamic sources. But in areas like the Holocaust denial, it is quite obvious that this is an importation, but the success of this implant can only be explained in terms of an extraordinary desire to believe that, uh, indeed, there was a hoax involved. When I made the film, The Longest Hatred, a term which I coined in 1990, I will never forget the interview in Egypt that we did with the translator, an Egyptian, who translated Arthur Butts. He said he was translating Arthur Butts' book, The Hoax of the Century, and that previously he had been responsible for one of the translations of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion into Arabic, of which there are many, many editions and different translations, and it's been a bestseller in many Arab uh, capitalist and um, even today it is um, it is very widely distributed even in countries non-arab countries Muslim countries such as Turkey where it's been a best very recently and um, and he said well uh, this is a classic answer that you receive very often uh, in the Middle East well of course um, you know the wise men of Zion he said you call them the wise men of Zion. They, um, they invented this because, and they should put up, it, it was so full of contradictions, but this discourse is classically contradictory. He said they should put up, the Zionists should put up a monument to Adolf Hitler, because without Hitler they would never have had their state. But in the same breath he said, of course, but they invented this. They invented this for money, they invented this for blackmail. They invented this because the Jews are liars and they are conspirators and they, they know how to do this. They are experts. The wise men of Zion are experts in this area. And even a more moderate uh, leader within the Arab world, such as Abu Mazen, Mahmoud Abbas, still uh, 
the leader of the Palestinian Authority, or what is left of that authority, wrote a work, which I actually read parts of it, I read in Russian because he wrote it in Moscow. He wrote it in Moscow when he was studying at Moscow's Oriental College in 1982, because we forget the scale of Soviet influence on the PLO through the 1970s and 80s. And Abu Mazen wrote his doctorate on the secret, the other side it was called, the secret relationship between Nazism and the Zionist movement. And that is a Holocaust denial work. The soft variety, Soviet style, typical of the early 1980s, when there were Soviet publicists like Lev Korneyev and others who cast doubt on the number of victims and of course emphasized the issue of Nazi Zionist collaboration. And Abu Mazen has kept very quiet about this, and nobody informed him about the fact that this man, who has received <coughs> billions of dollars in aid from uh, the United States, from the uh, European Union, from uh, many other sources, he's never, never questioned. I think the only people who ever questioned him were the son of his Center years ago. Because he said, I probably wouldn't write that now, which is a great relief to know. But what he meant was for political reasons he wouldn't write that now. He didn't say, I don't believe that. Um, and he is moderate, because the leaders of the Hamas were hardcore, Holocaust deniers, just as they are hardcore anti-Semites to this day, who make no bones about it. I have to give them full credit for honesty. I once, uh, must be one of the very few Israelis who ever sat opposite the man who succeeded, um, Sheikh Ahmad Yassin, as the leader of Hamas, uh, Abdul Aziz al Rantisi in Gaza, before he was dispatched to a better world. <clears throat> and he knew he was going to be dispatched. He was very philosophical about it. <clears throat> because this was a BBC film. And he spoke very frankly. He was no fanatic uh, in his way of talking, only in his beliefs. And we asked him, how come the Hamas, in its sacred covenant and in other writing, um, treats the Protocols of the Elders of Zion as a historic document. And he sort of had some problems with that, but it was suggested to him that it was a forgery, and that perhaps there was something wrong with using this in an official document. Uh, and he said, no, every day before our eyes, this is what we see in Palestine, this is, this is coming true. And when he came to the Holocaust, he wrote an article in the Hamas Weekly, al Salah which uh, was categoric in its absolute negation of the fact that the Holocaust had taken place. This was nothing but the Zionist plot. Last concluding remarks. Unavoidably concerned Iran. Because if we ask ourselves why today, why today we have to be very concerned about the role which Holocaust denial plays in a broader spectrum of views that concern anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism, terrorism, jihad, uh, the struggle of Iran to establish its regional hegemony as a first stage in implementing its ambitions. Here we have a non-Arab country, one which is in conflict, in fact, with most Sunni Arab states, which has embraced, for the first time ever, in post-war history, indeed in history at all, the first time that a state has, and a powerful state of that, of 80 million people, its leadership has embraced, among other features of its ruling ideology, Holocaust denial, and promoted it intensely, as you know, from that notorious conference held in December 2006 in Tehran from the propaganda that has continued to flourish uh, through Iranian sources. 
and even set up a Holocaust denial, or the equivalent of a Holocaust denial research institute in Tehran, instituted a famous cartoons contest uh, for Holocaust denial, um, and which has in fact fused together as part of its um, part of its propaganda for domestic and external purposes Holocaust denial with um, a ferocious anti-Zionist anti-Semitism a Shia messianism centered around the belief in the imminence of the return of the hidden Imam to bring a reign of justice throughout the world related to nuclearization because this is a necessary step, the nuclearization of Iran, in order to be able to implement its messianic aspirations for leadership and for the redemption of humanity which can only come through the worldwide hegemony of uh, Shia Islam. Given the rise of Shiite axis now in the Middle East, one which is gradually, slowly but surely taking over Lebanon, one which has reduced Syria to, in effect to a kind of satellite of Iranian ambitions, and which succeeded for the first time in truly infiltrating a Sunni uh, Arab movement, the Hamas that came to power in Gaza, and turning it to some degree into a proxy of its ambition, this becomes a, a truly uh, alarming prospect. It is a form of demonization. Holocaust denial has been, and still is, and will be always, one of the most extreme manifestations of anti-Semitism, even when anti-Semitism was not necessarily at the origin in every single case of uh, this ideology. So in the case of Iran, and this is my closing remark, what we have is the denial of Holocaust I as a possible preparation for Holocaust II. That perspective is enough to concentrate, I think, all our mind about the seriousness of this challenge. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have a good time for questions and answers. Thank you very much for the film. I have three questions. First, you know what? I'm sorry, we only have 20 minutes. Yeah. Yes, one question. Uh, yeah, okay. I can just one. Okay. Thank you. To put all the three questions in one question, uh, <laughs> uh, that's uh, the term inversion of truth. Uh, our clear friend Joel Fishman is using his term also the meaning. Some Arabs and Muslims, including Iran, uh, Iran, no, not Iran, but groups sponsored by Iran, use the term Holocaust, like your webpage Holocaust in Gaza.com. That means it's a, a strange case, a really strange case. It means people who deny the Holocaust, who will never talk about what happened during National Socialism in a political way, who were in favor of the Holocaust, nevertheless say, we don't want to have another Holocaust in Gaza, which is in, in several ways. Could, um, yeah, but it's nevertheless in a psychological way interesting because we could go to Gaza and talk with those Palestinians and say, well, first we have to acknowledge that the Holocaust happened, right? Because you cannot say Holocaust in Gaza if it didn't happen before in another way. So it's interesting, and yeah, in my way, it's a kind of very important point because uh, not just Muslims and Palestinians also let people use the term Holocaust for different events or whatever, for ecology, whatever. That means they, are, they don't really use it in a hardcore version, but in a softcore version, they deny it as well. Okay, you want to? Sure. Any other questions? Okay. Um, look, I have found sometimes in the same individual, uh, in the discourse on this subject, Simultaneously, without even perceiving the internal, as it were, contradiction 
suggesting that Nazism is a terrible thing and the proof is that the Israelis are Nazis, that the Israel armed forces are like the Wehrmacht, that the Israeli leaders are um, like uh, the Nazi leaders, and this is the ultimate form of racism. At the same time, they say the Zionists invented the Holocaust, implying therefore it didn't exist. If it was invented, it didn't exist. It's a hoax. Or, in a milder form, that they grossly exaggerated it, which admits that in some form it took place, but that they naturally exaggerated it for their own interests. And then saying what currently I believe to be the single most popular variation of Holocaust inversion, and not just among Muslims, but worldwide and virtually in all camps, right, left, and even some liberals uh, uh, going along with this, and mainstream newspapers, which is to say that the Israeli atrocities, quote unquote, against uh, the Palestinians are in fact, genocidal acts, and this, by implication, is the true genocide, and inverting the roles where, whereby, the historic roles, whereby the Palestinians become the Jews of the Middle East, and the Israelis become the Nazis and perpetrators. And there are many variations, some more sophisticated than that, some go into the realm of psychopathology and psychopolitics, if you read a book such as that by Jacqueline Rose, for instance, The Question of Zion, there you see a more sophisticated, but very misleading picture in my view, which says that the, the, the most terrible thing about Israel is that it's the patho pathologization of uh, the Holocaust which has, as it were, poisoned the Israelis, although it was in some sense implicit from the very beginning, which is very much a left-wing thesis that today. That in its very essence, from the beginning, Zionism was at least a colonial project. And that naturally, after the Second World War, this is not Holocaust denial, because it's saying, of course, it traumatized the Israelis. Right? But this is not said in a way that, therefore, we can empathize or perhaps understand something about the feelings of insecurity that do indeed drive much of Israeli politics. But uh, that it has traumatized in that pathological sense and brought about the the atrocities, quote unquote, which Israel is uniquely uh, found guilty. So the, the, there are a whole number, of, I think, of somewhat contradictory theses. But what is important, and what we've seen in the fallout from the Gaza war, is a massive, across the board, tendency, more than before, though it's been implicit for a long time now, to use Holocaustal imagery to define and redefine, rather, the Middle East conflict, and reduce it, in fact, to essentially to that, to, uh, but in a very one-sided way. There's only the issue of the, the current issue, the Catholic Church and the Pope and the dissident issue. Yes. Um, Benedictus the Sixteenth um, certainly is um, landed himself in some uh, heavy uh, <laughs> uh, waters, and and uh, I think um, you know I recently read what I thought was quite an astute assessment of what went wrong in the whole case associated with Bishop with this. Um, um, Catholic bishop, uh, British, uh, Richard Williamson, who is a Holocaust denier of long standing. And therefore the question arises, if he was rehabilitated and reintegrated along with other members of the Pius X sacred fraternity in the Catholic Church by Pope Benedict XVI, is it conceivable that people in Rome in the Curia were unaware? Is it conceivable? The answer is no. Of course they knew. Did the Pope know? Was he properly informed? Perhaps there's a question mark. Difficult to believe, but not impossible. 
that this man, who's a theologian, an intellectual, a German intellectual, um, and therefore as Der Spiegel defined it, I think very appropriately recently, Weltfremd, <laughs> not really aware of what's going on, um, outside of his a sort of narrow theological universe, that he might not have known that this particular individual was a Holocaust denier and anti-Semite, out and out, open anti-Semite. Um, but even in the best case scenario that he knew nothing, it's of course terrible, because it shows that uh, it shows a complete drift and lack of coordination and lack of judgment <laughs> astounding lack of judgment at, in the highest circles of the Curia. I'm pleased to say that many Catholics were appalled, particularly in Germany, by this, uh, and, and in fact believed that the Pope should stand down, which of course he, I imagine he won't do. Uh, but uh, that was noteworthy. There, there, there was a sense of, of deep disappointment, but there's a consistency in all this, I think. The very desire to reintegrate such a small section of the Catholic Church. People say the maximum numbers involved in this uh, highest to tenth fraternity is 500,000 people around the world in the largest Christian denomination of over one billion believers. Why was it so necessary to reintegrate these people who denied the Vatican II, who are fundamentalists of the first order, who are definitely a strong strand of anti-Semitism among the other things, within that fraternity. All these things were known, yet it was so important to the present Pope to have them back on board. What does that tell one beyond all the things that one already knows? Um, and I think many Catholics in themselves understand that. Um, getting back to what you said a moment before about the tendency to holocaustize the current conflict of the or a stage of the conflict of the Palestinians, do you think that the um, that Holocaust denial is an aspect of anti-Semitism in Europe in particular is perhaps um, connected to a desire of some Europeans to slough off the assignation of guilt for the Holocaust itself and of which they're very, very tired? Judging by movements within Germany to sort of talk about the, the sufferings of the Germans and so on. Okay, I'll give you my, my account of this very briefly uh, because I didn't speak directly at, about Germany, but undoubtedly the far right in Germany ever since World War II um, has always, for obvious reasons, um, denied the Holocaust and this has been true of most far-right movements in this or that measure, to a greater or lesser extent, because it is the main historical, political, psychological obstacle to fully rehabilitating some form of extreme nationalism or fascism. Uh, because as long as there is that stigma of mass murder associated with it, it's very difficult to fully revive. So, um, and in the case of, of Nazis, former Nazis, neo-Nazis, it's self-evident why they would be interested to do this. You had works like the Auschwitz Mythos and, and such titles in the 70s emerging openly in Germany, uh, and so on. Now, in the 80s, it seemed to me it's the beginning of a, some sort of a mainstreaming of this from another source. That was never accepted uh, um, into the heart of the debate, although... Um, probably Clemens, who has studied this uh, more closely than me, as far as uh, Germany goes, might, uh, might say something about that question. I believe something happened in the 80s. Uh, a number of things happened which uh, relate to what you're saying. For instance, such a leading intellectual and historian, philosopher of history like Ernst Nolte, and then his disciples, took on board a form of Holocaust revisionism without any doubt. And, and that entered subsequently into the so-called Historiker Streik in Germany of 1986 onwards. At that time, the climate wasn't fully right, as it were, for, for, um, for the full-scale penetration of the, this way of thinking. And part of what it stemmed from uh, was a feeling that already under 
Helmut Kohl's chancellorship and continued under Schroeder, the socialist, the normalization process, we Germans want to be, you know, patriots just like everyone else. We want a robust patriotism. You know, we have to put this be behind us. This uh, very powerful sentiment, very widespread according to all surveys of German opinion over many, many years, decades, it's consistent. Schluss mit der Vergangenheit, you know, and end with the past. This is three quarters, probably, of the German population consistently want this. Now, I think where Israel and the Palestinians come into this, and increasingly since the first Lebanon war, then the second Lebanon war, uh, of course, the Intifada, the two Intifadas, and now the Gaza conflict. And, and Germany is a, like a more obvious example, it exists everywhere, everywhere, uh, because of their scale of collaboration also during the Shoah. Um, partly it's being able to say you Israelis who set yourselves up as the uh, spokes people of the Jewish dead you know better than us and in fact you're worse and not only that but you didn't learn the lessons of the Holocaust like we Germans did because we had good pupils and of course there's some plausibility in that because in fact in Germany a lot of things were done in order to counteract the uh, you know, this past. And so there is that feeling. There's that desire for normalization. There is the feeling expressed by a prominent German writer such as Martin Walser and that whole Walser debata in the late 1990s when he talked about the Holocaust. Stop using the Holocaust as a moral cudgel, a stick with which to beat us. We cannot be free. We Germans spiritually, we can't sleep at night. Because of this, so it's got to stop. And then from the left already in the 70s and 80s, there was this sort of fast dinner approach, such as you know, in his play about the city and the death and so on, where he gave some expression to, to this feeling that, uh, which has some seed of truth in it, that uh, the commemoration of the Holocaust, the way it was done in Germany, the official spokesman paying lip service, remembrance. Part of this is insincere, some may be sincere. Uh, you know, there were moments, high points, Richard Weizsäcker's speech, 1986, Angela Merkel is probably sincere, but some of the people around her um, doubt. And, and, and then there is this Stammtisch, the ordinary Germans who are sick of it, and also the business of the reparations, and they don't feel that they are, you know, that they should be burdened with it. And this produces what is often called in Germany, for some reason, secondary antisemitism. Secondary, and so I don't see why it's secondary. Right? It seems to be quite primary. <laughs> You mentioned that uh, Abu Mazen said that uh, he probably wouldn't write Holocaust denial uh, book uh, today, and made the comment that uh, he didn't say that he didn't believe it now, and it was probably political. I, I have difficulty believing that intelligent people like that actually believe what they wrote. I wonder, could it really be? that he didn't believe it then, but then it was useful to write it, now it's not so useful for him.